So I will say, I will talk about disabled people and why we should or not be included because I'm also a disabled one. Probably you can even see it, but even if you don't, I, I just say it. So this is me in Geneva, by the way, speaking at some event in the UN. Uh, but uh, now I will start very briefly with a bit of basic intro. I mean, Mike said most of the stuff, but I tend to do it anyway in my speeches so people, you know, know who I am. So I am 33 from Poland, but I was born and live in Athens. I studied communication and journalism. That's why I speak a lot, as you see, and I'm feeling comfortable with people. Uh, I work as development officer and TRIPS project assistant for the European Network for Independent Living, ENIL. ENIL is, you know, the, the short for the whole name. And I will use it a lot later, so yeah, I'll try to remember it. I do basically membership stuff. I'm the, you know, the, the contact point for members and I do, you know, membership reviews and this kind of stuff. Communication, so newsletters, social media and all this, sometimes Zoom and all this kind of stuff. I am coordinating the youth network. I was in the board of youth network in the past. I'm helping them to be active. And a uh, trip project I'm supporting, which is a project we are in, and it's about uh, transport, how to make it inclusive and accessible. And uh, yeah, as I said, I'm a former youth network board member. And I did also a European voluntary service in the past, which I did for an in for the European network on independent living and for the uh, Flemish uh, independent living organization, uh, which is called on a Frank Eleven. Hope the Belgian people here don't kill me for the pronunciation. So now the EBS that doesn't exist anymore. You know it as European Solidarity Corps. Uh, so this is the alternative. But more or less is the same thing. And uh, yeah, I will stay a lot in that aspect of the EBS. Other interesting stuff about me very briefly is that I'm co-founder and chair of I Living, the first and only independent living organization in Greece, the country I live. And I will explain why, why we did it, why we created it. And I am chairing also the Youth Committee of the European Disability Forum, where I represent the Youth Network of Emil. And uh, yeah, part of that, I am an activist. I mean, it's a bit, you know, fun word. I mean, that, what it means, what it means, what does it mean, activist? But yeah, I, I, call, I consider, it my, consider myself one. And I'm also a travel blogger. This is the name of the travel blog I have in the social media and on the website. It's from the traveler and the wheeler. So I made it traveler. It's new word. Uh, because, yeah, this is my passion. I travel a lot also for work and activism. So, yeah, if I said, why not make a blog and yeah, motivate people to travel? So I am going to the next slide. Indeed, I will say my journey. Uh, I mean, it's a bit weird because I don't like to, you know, to, I, mean, I know it seems a bit cocky. Oh, okay, he speaks about himself. And I mean, you know, I don't really want to, you know, to do that in a way to promote myself. But I think it will be useful for what we want to talk today and in general in this event. And hopefully it will, you know, you will see that it's not that much about myself but also about you and about, you know, the Europe in general. All that's my goal at least. We'll see if I manage to do it. So I, so I start my journey from the studies period. Before that, nothing interesting is happening. And happening. So I studied communication here in Greece. And here you see from the graduation ceremony, there's a photo. And until then, I was an average guy, didn't do much. I was, I didn't want to be involved in disability stuff uh, because I wanted to do mainstream stuff and I was thinking that yeah, I don't want, even when I was studying journalism, people say, oh, good, you will write about our problems. I was saying, hey, guys, did you ask me? I don't want to write about disability. I want to write about sports, about traveling, about culture. I don't know, you know. But uh, so I have this mentality. And I was a good student. I considered this as my work, as my obligations. I was going to university following lectures and I yeah, had a good 
good uh, grades and everything. Then in 2013, uh, I got a message from Stelios Kiburopoulos. He is one of the guys in the photo. He is now an MEP, so member of the European Parliament from Greece. He is also disabled. And he was organizing a Greek team of disabled people to, to Strasbourg to attend a freedom drive, which is a big event organized by EMIR, the European Network for Independent Living, on independent living, on personal assistance, on day institutionalization. It's like a flagship event of the organization every two years. Back then it was, it was happening in Strasbourg, now it's happening in Brussels. And uh, we attended it. We see what it means to have independent living. We met people from all over Europe, from Norway to Bulgaria and from, I don't know, Portugal to Bosnia or whatever. So we discussed with them. We saw that they know about independent living. They have personal assistance. They take people out of institutions. They have choice and control and all this stuff. And we say, in Greece, we have no idea about it. So we need to do something. So six of us, we were 11 disabled with our assistance. Six of these 11 decided to come back to Greece and to make an organization, the, the Independent Living Organization of Greece, which is a DPO, Disabled People's Organization. And now I am chairing it at some point, you know, Stelios was chairing it and some other period, people. So Stelios is one of the co-founders, me, and uh, four other disabled people. So that's, let's say, the beginning when I got into the independent living, into disability, through the independent living, let's say, door. I was thinking that, okay, if I have to do disability stuff, I want to do independent living stuff because for me, everything starts from here. If we have the right support to choose how we want to live and, you know, to have control over our life, then we can uh, fight for everything else, like accessibility, inclusive education, and whatever. So, uh, okay, now it's strange. So, yeah, I was, you know, involved with the meeting the independent living stuff. I hope you can see everything because it seems like I lost something for a second. By the way, if there is any chat, comment, or something, feel free to let me know. I mean, if I speak quick or, or if you have questions, burning questions, and you want to interrupt me, just let me know because I cannot see it at the moment. So, yeah, just, just interrupt me. I don't get offended. So I was, but I was, you know, so I was still not doing much. I mean, I was doing a bit of independent living stuff, but I was still, um, yeah, not sure what to do and how to, you know, move. I, I know that I knew that one of my dreams is to move abroad and to live a bit abroad because my friends from university did it a lot and other people. So, I mean, I know that it would be more difficult for me because I am disabled and I need a lot of support, actually almost 24 hours or 24 hours because, I mean, I cannot eat myself. I cannot move my phone myself. I cannot, you know, go to the toilet or even in the bed, I need someone to tell me sites. So I need a lot of assistance and this is making, making it difficult to move abroad. But then I saw the, on the Facebook of Emil of the European Network for Independent Living that there is an opportunity. They do together with the Flemish Independent Living Organization and EVS, a voluntary service, and they are encouraging disabled people to apply. And, you know, to go six months to Ghent and, you know, to work with them. Ghent, but also to Brussels. That's why I also had opportunities to go to Brussels. Because one organization was in Brussels, the hosting one was in Ghent, so I was going, you know, from Brussels to Ghent like every two days. It was a very nice experience. Uh, everything was covered when it comes to accessibility, which was very surprising. So I was getting all the support that an average Erasmus person is getting. So, you know, boarding, food, traveling, this kind of stuff. But I was getting also additional money from the National Agency of Belgium for the Flanders, I think. Uh, hint, if I'm correct, which is one of the best of the national agencies, as far as I know in terms of accommodating disabled people. And uh, did, did someone say something, sorry? Well, I was just saying, Camilla, that it's very true. Thank you for the compliments. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's a joke. <laughs> no, thank you. Well, that's true. I mean, I know that, you know, they care, you care a lot about disabled 
people and youngsters and we want to give a lot of opportunities. And we will see it also later. Uh, so I got support for personal assistant and it was the first time and the only until now that I had personal assistant the way it should. So, you know, with, with budget, which goes to, to myself and I give it to the person I want to support me. And yeah, I was able to do the CBS. And I was told, I don't know if it's true, that back then in 2015, I was the first one in Flanders who got budget for personal assistance. If that's the case, that's very interesting. Because after me, a lot of people were kind of motivated and went to do the same. And now Belgium is costing numerous disabled people every year, which is something which, if happens, thanks to me, I'm very proud of that. So, yeah, I was again, which is one of the best cities for me. And I mean, I, I want to live there at some point because I consider it my second home. And yeah, Brussels is also a place I really love. And I go even now very often. And I can tell you that I will be there again in October if everything in COVID allows it. So, I mean, I like it. And here you see also a photo in the middle from the field of the 2015. It is during my EBS. And we are attending, this is in Brussels now. And here it's me and my assistant. And you know, we are calling one, how you call it? Uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah. I don't know how to call it the board or, uh, yeah, I don't remember now the English word, but you see it. And we are marching from in Brussels, you know, I don't know, 200 disabled people. It was like very big happening in Brussels. They didn't see, they haven't seen so many disabled people marching and shouting free our people, institution, no solution, and stuff like that. From, you know, out of, in the, out of European institutions like European Commission, European Parliament, we met with MEPs. That's the only point. And, you know, we had our conference and stuff like that. So the first Freedom Drive got me into the disability activist and I was participant. And two years later, I was in the organizing team in the way of, I mean, I was a volunteer, so not much, but still, you know, I was on the other side, which was a good step. And during my years, I had opportunities to develop my skills, to attend conferences, to speak. Here I am speaking in the European Parliament about my experience. And I was, I, I was given a lot of opportunities for my organization to network, to meet people, to attend important meetings. Even if I didn't speak or do something, I was following, you know, meetings in the commission, meetings in the Brussels bubble with other organizations. So this gave me opportunities to develop and to, you know, to make, to make, do network and to build things. So even the fact that I'm speaking today with you, it's kind of thanks to the CBS, you know, because a lot of things started at this point. And uh, I, of course, it was not only work and stuff because EBS and now European Solidarity Corps is not only work and stuff like that. You have a lot of fun, you discover, you enjoy, you learn about culture, you learn about yourself. So this is a photo from Bruce during Christmas because it was the first and only Christmas I didn't spend at home. I spent abroad and it was a nice experience. And you know, Bruce at Christmas is very nice. But Ghent is even better. I love a lot of Ghent. So now in Belgium, I love more Ghent from Bruce. This is one my understanding. Uh, which I agree. And so now I go to the next slide. Uh, so after my EBS, I came back to Greece. It was a fantastic experience and I thought that I need you know, to make something out of it because I still was unemployed and I didn't have something complete you know, to move my future. But I am a guy who likes to turn the opportunities presented to me. So thanks also to the networks I have made during my EBS. I started to apply to different events, you know, also through Salto, because, you I mean, know, I... Yes? Your five minutes is here. Okay, I will try to do it in five. <laughs> so also through Santo and through things. And I attended a lot of trainings, representing also in Europe at some point, and attended, I attended study sessions. This one is a mixed stability study session in Strasbourg, so disabled and non-disabled. By the way, this training is from Vienna at this point. Also very good national agency, the Austrian one. Uh, I mean, there are many are good national agencies, but these are the ones I know. That's why I'm mentioning it. No offense to the other ones. I'm sure a lot of you do great job. And then I got the opportunity to represent the youth network of Enil 
at the European Disability Forum and in the Youth Committee of the European Disability Forum. And I was elect, select, elected chair. We, and I am until now, my term is ending next year, normally this year, but because of COVID, I'm ending next year. And this gave me a lot of opportunities to network in the disability out of independent living. So to do a lot of different stuff from transport to, I don't know, to any you can imagine related to independent, to disability, you know, to disability assessment, to freedom of movement, and other stuff. And, and I got also my first job at an in the organization I volunteered. I saw one day a post and they were looking for a guy who would do communication and membership. I already knew the organization, knew the members. I have communication background. So I think I was a good, I had good chances. So I applied and now I'm working for them. And I'm very proud because this is the organization I really identify myself. And yeah, I think we are doing good things. We are challenging commission about institutions. We even took them to the court. No one do that. So I'm very proud that we don't, you know, we are not afraid to challenge the European institutions and powerhouses when something is not okay. Because we our our priority is disabled people and we are disabled people. So it's from disabled to disabled. We are a grassroots organization. And very quickly, that's almost the end. And nowadays, uh, not not nowadays, but uh, this is you know, after that, I, you know, developed a lot and started, you know, to create, let's say, a name. So I had the opportunity to go to New York to speak at the high-level political forum in the UN. I did a lot of the opportunities to speak and participate in events in the commission, in the parliament, but not only as attenders, but also as speakers, sometimes even paid for that. It was a big, you know, step forward. You know, you still need to convince them that you need personal assistance, you need special budget for kind of stuff, but it works. I started to do trainings. Now not following ones, but training people. So this one is in Portugal. And I'm one of the trainers helping other young disabled people, you know, getting skills. And some of them are now doing very great. And I attended also Freedom Drive in 2019. Now from the part of organizing. So I was responsible also for the program and for the staff. This, this photo is from the European Commission where we had when we had our general assembly of European level of independent living. And this is my practically last slide. Uh, what I'm doing today, I mean, with COVID, this is not a problem because as you see, Zoom is helping. So we are continuing to do stuff. This is a meeting of the Youth Committee of European Disability Forum. I am one of them, the one I'm chairing, as I said. Yeah, I mean, but I attended a lot of other events. I'm getting opportunities to be kind of influencer. So I commissioned a project with last year to be one of the influencers. I don't really like the words, but this is the way the word they used to be ambassador, let's say, for the Access City Award, which is an award European Commission is giving every year to, to accessible cities in the EU. And because you know I'm also a travel blogger and I love I love the awards. I am, I am attending the ceremony in Brussels every year since 2015 in my EBS. It was a very honor for me to, you know, to be an influencer for them. And this year, the commission approached me again to be an influencer for the European city of rail. With, so again, I want to bring the disability perspective to the rail and how rail can be accessible and this kind of stuff. We are still discussing, you know, the details, so it's not official, but hopefully I will also work again with commission for that. And I'm sitting on the same table with the Greek government. We are now bringing an disability, sorry, an independent living law into the into the Greek law. Who could imagine it five years ago? But now we are bringing a personal assistant law. Hopefully it will come in, in, in autumn this year. And we will have some a pilot project with personal assistant. And, and also one of the projects about the institutionalization, again, with the government. And I remind you, they have no idea about this stuff a few years ago. We played a big role for them to know it. I mean, me, Stelios, who became also MEP, and a lot of other people. So this is, you know, good thing. And I mean, I was also in the, you know, getting opportunities to speak in nice events, like the one I'm attending today, or the one uh, I attended last year, the European Youth World Convention, where I met also Limonas, among others, and some of you. And it was, you know, also an honor to be there. And yeah, who knows? That's why I put a question mark 
who knows what's next. I take it step by step and, you know, slowly, 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 I'm kind of developing. So hopefully now I see that my priority is to support other people the way I was supported so far. So because, you know, I didn't do it myself, a lot of people helped me and we will discuss it actually now. And yeah, this is what I see now that is my role, you know, to be the stepping stone for the next generation. And these are a few questions. I know that we, uh, that you will discuss it now in the in the ah, breaking groups. And Miki created a document so you can have the questions also in the groups. You can, you know, see, uh, you know, discuss together. There is no correct or, or bad uh, or wrong answer. And you don't have to work on all the questions you can choose. But these are some questions I thought that might be interesting for the last part of the session today after the group. After you discuss in the group meet group discussions, we will come back to plenary and we will discuss a few of this issue and all of your questions and all the stuff you might have. So my question is very briefly is why disabled people should be visible or maybe invisible. Do you feel inspired? Why yes or no? How do you think that I achieved what I achieved? How will others do it? So uh, yeah, what it's needed so other people like me and even more disadvantaged because I don't consider myself. I consider myself of the, in the privileged side and in the lucky ones. So there's a lot of people who are much, very much, much more barriers and obstacles you know, to do anything. So how we will help them to do similar journeys because there is a lot of potential here and we need to help them. I mean, to support them, not to help them. And uh, yeah, how, do you see yourself having a role in this? This is a question I would like also to touch at some point. And I think this is the last slide. I mean, the last one is a thank you with my email, my personal email, and my Twitter uh, handle. So that's it, I think. Thank you for your attention. Sorry if I speak a bit more than the, the time I should. Now, okay, I closed it. I will stop sharing, so I can also see you and you can see me better. Okay. Yeah, now I give the floor to Mika. Yeah, thank you, Camille. That was, uh, even if you bit over time, it was fantastic to listen to you. So Sorry thank you. for that. <laughs> no, 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 it's really wonderful. Thank you. But um, yeah, it's very insightful just to listen to your journey. And it's absolutely fantastic to see how, how this program can just support so well, isn't it? Not just by giving the finances, but also just giving the opportunities and having the support in place to support those opportunities. It's exactly what this seminar is about. It's very inspirational for me. It was listening to you. Um, I have the feeling that we might be running a little bit out of time with this input. So I hope people are okay with that because I do think I see questions coming in, but also I think the questions that Camille posted there are really good questions to discuss together in your working group. So we're going to give you the 10 minutes in your work group to discuss those. You don't have to discuss them all as Camille said, they're just kind of pointers to, to have a discussion and digest what he's been talking about and make it that little bit deeper. And for afterwards, I would really like you to post your questions in the chat so we can work through them. Yeah. And if they're not all being answered, then in the time that we have, Camille can even maybe answer some later than at some stage. I'd say Camille would be happy enough to do that. Yeah. So we have them at least on, we have them on file, those questions. So what we do now, I'll ask Limanas to put you in your rooms. Um, you have the link for the questions and have an enjoyable discussion and yeah, inspire each other even more. 10 minutes, right? Thank you so 10 minutes. Good. Yeah, 10 minutes. We'll give the full 10 minutes. I think it's important. By one. Yeah, so welcome back everybody. And um, I'll hand you back to Camille now, who's going to answer the questions that are gonna appear in the chat, okay? Yeah, so. thank you. I will start with the chat and yeah, I mean, if you afterwards want to raise your hand and we have time and everything, feel free, you know, to just, or even just pop in the discussion. So the first question I see is from Anya about uh, that before seeing this post information on Facebook page of an 
if I knew about TVS before, no, I think I don't. I mean, uh, I knew there is some problems, but I have no really real idea how they work and what they are. And even when I saw this, I was not sure that in the end I would be able to do it. I was thinking that they have no idea, you know, about my disability costs and needs, and they just want to have someone disabled, but they don't really know that I would need traditional budget. But it happens that I didn't knew, and they knew. So they were able to, you know, to allocate the budget I needed. I was like very hesitant. I was thinking, yeah, but I will need this, you know? And they say, yeah, okay, fine. And I say, yeah, but also this. And they say, yeah, sure, that's fine. So, yeah, it happened. And, and uh, you know, back then still, I didn't have everything. Nowadays, it's even better. Nowadays, you have more proper support. But I mean, my was also very good. So that's the question of Anya. Uh, now I see Lydia sent numerous questions, so I would try to answer this. Should the person tell hosting NGO about her, his disability difficulties? Yes, I think it should be he or she should. Because, I mean, if you want, I mean, you decide what you prefer, but if you want your needs to be met and, you know, to have the proper support and also for the organization to do the reasonable accommodation and everything, and if you want to be prepared and everything to work good, better you say what you need and not just go and then, you know, it's the same with Tinder. If you are on, the, if you are on Tinder or on a dating app and you don't say you're disabled, you may date someone, but when you meet them, they may, they may feel shocked and then you have a problem. But if you say from the beginning that you're disabled, then you know they like you from the beginning. So, I mean, it's not the same thing exactly, but it's kind of, you know, the same logic. It's good from the beginning to be clear what you need. At, at least this is my perspective. I want to, you know, to be clear. Say you need, I will need personal assistance. I will need accessible transport, step-free accommodation, whatever. Can you provide this? If yes, okay. If no, what can we do for that, you know? Or you should do that because you are obliged. I don't know, whatever, you know, depending on the case. You know. So, yeah, I think it's good to state your needs. I mean, if your needs are not very big needs and you don't want to say because you feel more comfortable that way, you are fine, you are free to do that, but yeah, it will be easier for you to state, to state what you need. The second question is what if she, he is aware of the difficulties and said working on it, but doesn't feel like sharing information with everyone else because of Asperger autism or whatever. Yeah, that's, I mean, I guess it's fine as long as it as he or she feels that they can do that. I wouldn't be afraid of sharing though, because people are, my experience is that people are usually better than we think they are most of the times, and they are very accommodating and want to support us. So, I mean, if we are clear what we need, in the beginning it might seem weird or something, but then the people see beyond your disability. So. They know that, okay, because of autism, you may, I don't know, do something which normally you wouldn't, really a movement or something. And if you don't say anything, it might feel a bit strange for them. But if they know it, they will most likely embrace it and continue. And yeah, but it's still okay. I mean, you don't have to share something. Yeah, Tony, I see your hand. Yeah, maybe quickly to add from the, the program point of view, um, <clears throat> I think it's very important to uh, build up some trust and um, communication, yeah? So if a person doesn't feel uh, um, comfortable to disclose personal information, yeah, then of course for the project that might have big consequences. So uh, the, there needs to be some kind of uh, communication, trust, uh, so that you can talk about it together. And that's not only with the national agencies to ask for the, the extra support or the extra money, uh, but especially with your project partners, huh? so that you don't arrive in a situation where things are not what you need. Yeah. So um, in that sense, it is important to to yeah find the right partners where you can have this trustful relationship and uh, cooperation. Yeah, exactly. And I want also to add that they understand that, especially in the past, there was a lot of stigma and a lot of people were not easily describing, you know, what they need and they want, they didn't want to go with a, a visible way, but probably 
you know, hiding a bit and after they achieve something, then they said. But now we are developing, people are more, more and more aware into the societies are more and more aware. You know, people know about mental health issues, they know about disability, about different sexual uh, the directions, about everything. So now, you know, it's weird in societies that more, most likely will embrace the difference and the diversity. So it's good for us as well, you know, to feel ourselves and who we are. It's not a problem. So I would advise that, you know, you don't, there is no reason to hide, but I think it's up to the person. It's totally fine. There is no obligation to share anything. But it would be more challenging if we don't share. Especially as Tony said, for practical reasons also. I mean, if you don't have access next, but you don't say anything, and you go there, you cannot get the access next last minute. You need to know it in advance, for example. And I mean, if you have access to as an autistic, for example, uh, it might be, I don't know, additional time or something. It's also good for the organization to know in advance that you need to rest or to work less or whatever. Because then it can happen. The other question is, what are the possible resources to help to prepare a group of volunteers before a person with difficulties arriving? I think that will be answered on Friday, right, Tony? Yeah, yeah maybe to add. Um... So there will be a session, as Camille said, on Friday, uh, 10 a.m. Brussels time on what are the specific inclusion possibilities uh, within the Erasmus Plus youth part of the program and the European Solidarity course or so extra funding and stuff like that. So I would uh, like to refer to Friday, uh, 10 a.m. And another thing I would like to announce is that within the strategic partnership on inclusion, so in the disability strand, uh, we're working on a disability inclusive uh, checklist. So a little publication, 30 pages for mainstream organizations that are uh, planning to, to take the young people with uh, uh, disability on an international project. So all the kind of things like what should you take into account, also talking about trust, about special needs, etc. cetera. Um, and in there, there will also be um, a section about what kind of resources are there. Yeah, both in the program, but also more the educational or the the day-to-day -day, uh, resources. Uh, so um, uh, that is coming up. It will be launched uh, after summer in Iceland, and then it will be uh, available on the, the uh, SPI uh, webpage on Salto. So uh, that is coming as well. Yes, yeah, thank you, Tony. And yeah, uh, so this will be answered afterwards. I see. Also, the last question is from Lydia is. Is there a possibility to be trained in a way to lead them through, to give them support they might need? Uh, this is a bit difficult. I mean, because every person is very different. One of my sisters is also disabled like me. In paper, we have the same. In real life, we have different needs. So, I mean, you, you need to have a personal approach anyway. So, a training would be, I don't know, some ba maybe basic guidelines, you know, like the Santo is preparing and stuff, might be useful, but that's after that, you, you need to talk with the person and to have, you know, a one-on-one -on -one and what you need. We are here for you and all this stuff. At the NIL, we are hosting every year up to two disabled volunteers in Brussels, which is not very accessible, by the way. Brussels, it's one of the problematic European capitals. And, but we manage and we have different needs every year. We had blind persons, we have wheelchair users. We had a person with autism, I think. Also some mental other kinds of something. So we need to, you know, we talk with everyone in separately and see what they need because you, you cannot assume you know everything in the beginning. So yeah, but yeah, some basic guidance put can be always useful. Let's see if there's other uh, questions. What posting for organization was then in Ghent and are still active? Ah, that's from Mike. So uh, in uh, Ghent, the hosting, my posting for organization was named one of Hankeli Cleven. So it means independent living in Dutch, I think. The Dutch people here can confirm if I'm okay. And they are active. I don't know if they are doing keep European Solidarity Corps now, because even I was working typically for them, practically I was for an ill. So after that, an ill took you know, over and doing a lot of stuff. So I don't really know. I mean, I know they are active generally, but I don't know if they continue to host volunteers and do this kind of stuff. Uh, what else? Anna asks, thank you, Camille. In your opinion and by your experience, what context are generally more prepared to host persons with these conditions? 
formal honor from education. And I don't know. I mean, can be everywhere, depending on you know the environment of the or the mentality of the organization, of the awareness. Yeah, non-formal education is by nature more open, I think, and and you know it's a lot of more activities happen with diverse groups, like the Erasmus training, youth exchanges. I have been in a lot of them, which I am the only disabled people are among, I don't know, 40 or 30 youngsters. You know, so and this is non-formal education usually. But it's possible, you know, you do it. You still need, you know, to think a bit stuff, small stuff that even energizers, sometimes they are not accessible. They say, okay, now let's go out and do a quick run in the pond to energize ourselves. Yeah, thank you, I cannot do that. <laughs> so I mean, you know, this kind of stuff, but... So, but yeah, you know, this for stuff, but people are, want to support and you know, this kind of, so it always works. And usually trainers are supporting as well. When I need something, for example, I was in a training and they said, uh, okay, now you take your phone and you vote in this application, but I cannot do that on the spot because I need someone to do it for me. And my mother doesn't speak English, and I was with my mother. So a trainer came to me, and he was taking my phone and using you know, all the stuff. For me, it did work. So, I mean, there is always solutions. So I don't see any other questions at this point. I know we're one minute before <laughs> the official time. I don't know if you have other questions. Uh, there I mean, is. Ivan, and if we have time for that. Then, no, we don't really have much more time for any other questions. There is just one really quick one. Freedom Drive, the event that is organized across Europe. Freedom Big Drive? Day. Yeah. Freedom Drive is every two years. Now, because of COVID, we take it next year. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's about, yeah, it's the independent living movement all over Europe. Are coming, can we meet? I'm all over Europe. Last year, we had even Japanese people, eh? like yeah. 20 Japanese people, and they were the highlight of the event. So yeah. I mean, the independent living movement in Japan came. But yeah. in basically, it's a European one. We meet with European, me the members of the parliament, with commissions. We have our conference, our general assembly, and we talk about our staff. Personal assistance, DI, the institutionalization, and everything that could be, you know, important for us. You yeah. know, how, how people with autism can live independently, how people with high support needs can do that, and all this stuff. And before I close, because I know we have time to tell, I, I want to leave with a message that this is not a personal success. And this one I wanted to say, I didn't want to speak about myself and say that I succeeded. This is a success of Europe and of the, of the inclusive projects. So thanks to the whole support system, thanks to the opportunities of commission, thanks to the work of, uh, of the national agencies, of the people who supported, of disabled people who support each other also of mm -hmm. non-disabled people who support us. These things are possible, and this is why I think your role is important, because, and our role in general, because, yeah, thanks to us, thanks to you, people like me can do that. So that's the message, probably. It's not, I mean, you're only a person plays a role, because if you, are, if you don't care, you don't move. And uh, for example, in my case, I wanted to move forward, but it was thanks to people and thanks to Europe that they managed to do that.